The following interview was conducted with Morgan Burke, the Director of Intercollegiate Athletics for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, June 3rd, 2008 at Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Thank Tell you. Tell us about where you were born and your parents and siblings in your early years. Well, I was born in Indianapolis, Indiana, December 17th, 1951, uh, youngest of four. Mom and dad have East Coast roots, uh, uh, both from Waterbury, Connecticut. Dad uh, played football at uh, Colgate and then had a long sales career with a company by the name of Chase Brass and Copper. Led him out to Indianapolis where, uh, where he was transferred in the, after World War II. Mom was um, oldest of nine and uh, had been uh, uh, attended Barnard College, which is now part of Columbia. She's going to be a civil engineer. She's going to follow her uh, dad's footsteps, which would have been a little unique in, in her era. And uh, uh, depression hit and uh, she needed to come home and help with the family. So she probably is the smartest non-college graduate I know. And uh, we grew up in Indianapolis. I attended Bray Buff High School in Indianapolis. Uh, my spouse, uh, Kate Burke, whose a, a maiden name is Kate Mullane, is from Indianapolis as well. And uh, actually uh, attended and uh, completed her pharmacy degree here at Purdue. Okay. What was high school like? Tell us a little bit. Were you involved in some of your athletics? and? Uh, that student I was, uh, yeah. I, I actually, Brebuff was an interesting school at the time. Uh, it was a Jesuit uh, preparatory school, and I was part of the fourth graduating class. And at that time, it was all boys, which would be a little unique. It, it went co-ed in the mid-70s. Uh, but it was shirts and ties uh, for class, which is kind of interesting to see that beginning now to, to come back in vogue. And um, you, 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 the school was small enough where you were involved in a lot of extracurricular activities. Now, Clearly, I swam, but the interesting parallel is that in the in, when I was coming out of, of high school in the late 60s, boys swimming would be like women's sports were in the 80s. Uh, didn't get any attention. We didn't have a high school team, so I still had to swim with my club team, and it was kind of you felt a little bit odd because uh, this was an interest, but it wasn't you know yeah, it just they it, couldn't they, go very far. Yeah, and it, it, it's very much akin to what what I think the women have experienced in the 70s and 80s. Uh, then finally, they did introduce a team my senior year, but of course, you know, we had to buy our own suits and goggles and all that stuff. But uh, and so I have some empathy. I, I didn't realize it at the time, but for the plight of the of the young women that uh, as I came back to Purdue and ran uh, athletics, but it was a good experience. I think the the, the education I received was uh, top rate, <clears throat> and it made my entry into Purdue uh, a, a somewhat easier. Uh, Purdue gave me a partial swimming scholarship to come here in 1969. Turned out I was a better student than a swimmer. Uh, I tried, but uh, my dreams of going to the Olympics came up a little short. But I think you learn some things about life when it doesn't go your way. Right. You don't like it when you're doing it, but I think it... it uh, over the long haul. Yeah, over the long haul, it, it prepares you to recognize you just got to keep persisting and that ultimately something good will happen. And uh, that's probably in, in, a, in a kind of a... Uh, unique way is what drove me uh, to, to Purdue in 1993 was just the ability to you can instill in these talented young people uh, the life skills that go along with the attempt to compete at the highest levels along with world-class education they're well suited to take on the challenges of the 21st century and that's why you should do something like athletics at, the, at a university uh, um, it is a it is a best form of leadership training right. you can possibly yeah. provide Tell us a little about campus life when you were here. Did you were you in a fraternity? Was I was a member of Phi Gamma Delta, six forty okay. Russell Street, still there. And turns out all three of our children, uh, daughter Joyce, uh, who's a materials engineer from Purdue, uh, son Morgan, who's a landscape architect from Purdue, he's out in San Francisco, and then uh, Patrick uh, will graduate in a year uh, in industrial engineering. And uh, both boys are Phi Gams too, so we we kind of. <laughs> clustered together, and there are no arguments around the dinner table when the Boilermakers are on. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> uh, then tell us, and then you did some, you got a graduate degree from after Purdue. Well, I was graduate. all set to go to law school. Uh, I admitted to IUPUI in Indianapolis, and that was where I was heading until uh, Cupid got me. And uh, uh, Kate had a fifth year in pharmacy. At that time, the pharmacy program was five years, it's now, now six. And uh, so it, it made sense to help her finish her uh, uh, work. And so I, I was, you know, I was looking for employment, and they had an opportunity as a graduate assistant with a swimming program. I thought, well, better go to graduate school. I talked to the, to the folks at Cranford, because my undergraduate was in business, and they said, you know, 
to just put the MBA on top of it probably doesn't make sense because you've done a lot of that as your undergrad. And so they steered me toward what they called industrial relations in those days. Today they would call it human resource management. And that turned out to be a wise move because most of my life has been in the kind of the personnel area. Right, okay. And then a, then uh, your career path after, then you, you went to, uh, what did you do after? I went to Inland Steel in June of uh, 1975. And that was an interesting period. It was a very, very challenging economy. And uh, in those days, you would, you would come to Stewart Center and sign up for the interviews. And, uh, you know, it wasn't uncommon to get up at 3 or 4 in the morning to try to get in line to, to be in the interviews. And uh, I remember uh, seeing those people. Yeah. Been here and, and, uh, so I, uh, I was fortunate. I had a professor in uh, Craner, Joe Ullman, who was one of my uh, kind of senior advisors. And he said, you know, I've got a friend at Inland Steel that we've worked with, done some consulting with over the years. Would you have any interest? You know, I didn't, at that point in time, I was interested in about anything. And uh, uh, that led, through that connection, to being interviewed. And they had a, what they called an industrial relations trainee program. For about two years, they'd rotate you through different slots and basically give you an opportunity to learn the company and they get to learn a bit more about you. That was a great experience. And uh, I stayed at Inland for 18 years until the, the Purdue uh, seed uh, kind of was planted, and, and here I am. How did you, did, uh, did they come to touch, how did you get about the position at Purdue? Well, it, it is kind of an ironic story. Uh, during my tenure at, at Inland, I did go to law Excuse school. Excuse me, but in the meantime, you went to law school. Yeah, I, I, would, I did. I was gonna, yeah, yeah. I, I went, <clears throat> and I'll never forget that story, because Kate, uh, I think it was about 1976 and, and, or 77, she, she said to me in the summer, she says, if you don't go to law school, you're going to regret it. You're always going to be, you know, you'll be angry at me that you didn't go to school. And so I, I applied and my grades were good here in graduate school but my my LSAT scores were dated and so they turned me down at first saying that I would have to take the LSATs and so I asked for an appointment went and saw the dean and the admissions people I said you know I've been to graduate school I've done well I really don't see why this particular test is is and they, they bought it they said that was a good argument and so uh, I did that at night so I traveled down there uh, to Chicago for, for, from our home in Munster for, for four years. And that was a tremendous struggle for Kate. It wasn't okay. an easy experience, but uh, she was a trooper. And, and we had two, two youngsters come along at that time, so, uh, so much for planning. Uh, but, uh, you know, it worked good. And then uh, late 90, early 90s, uh, George King, who uh, had been the athletic director when I was here, uh, announced his retirement. And George's son and I were fraternity brothers. And I had known George and his wife, Jean, very well. And I came home from a business trip. I was up at our iron ore property in Minnesota. And uh, it's Memorial Day weekend, it's Friday night, I'll never forget it. And Kate said, I saw George, I saw him the transaction column that George is going to retire. So I, you know, as a Friday night, I just called director assistance, got his number, and I said, you know, I just want you to, to, to know that a lot of us appreciate what you did. And I know it was a little bumpy here at the end, but uh, we really appreciate it. And it's during that conversation, he said, well, what are you doing? And I told him what I was doing. He said, well, you know, <clears throat> that's the background they're looking for. They want somebody with a business background who has an athletic affinity. And if I can put somebody with a Purdue uh, connection, that's all the better. He said, but I, you're going to have to decide whether you want to put your name in the hopper. And about four weeks later, uh, uh, Kate and I said, you know, why not? It was one of those things where you didn't think it would ever happen, but you said, well, eh, it doesn't hurt to talk. And uh, I remember going to the president of Inland at that time. I was the vice president of, of our operating administrative services mm -hmm. area and not wanting him to find out because I wasn't, I'm not a job jumper, obviously. I've only had two jobs. And, and I told him, and he, he had been the plant manager at Alcoa here in Lafayette. So he's very at familiar. At one time, huh? Yeah, very familiar at Purdue. And so he, uh, you know, he kind of said, well, yeah, yeah, go ahead, you know, but I think he was chuckling in the back of his mind. And then, you know, just one thing led to another, and here I am. Very good. And you came. Well, now we're, we're down at, we are at Purdue. And let's talk a little bit about the vision of your sport. You as an administrator, some of the challenges and communication and uh, leadership, and also recruit, and something about recruitment for directors and head coaches, some of the things. Well, the biggest, the biggest challenge is that Purdue, we're a self-supporting auxiliary enterprise, right. and, and that means we're like a little business within the university. We, we certainly are, are uh, uh, compliant with the university policies and procedures, but 
we got to push the envelope a bit or we can't we can't balance the books my job is to raise money uh, and it's I don't raise it for buildings although buildings are important I raise it to give young people opportunities <clears throat> and um, you know our scholarship bill uh, when I first came to Purdue is about two million dollars a year at seven for the, roughly the same number of, uh, of youngsters so I have to I have to be able to inspire people to want to be part of a cause uh, we have 9,000 John Purdue Club members today. We're on our way to 12,000 because I think more people, as, particularly as we push the whole notion of student-centered activities as Dr. Cordova will, will launch with the strategic plan this June, this is a natural fit. And you know, you'd like everybody to be able to endow a scholarship. We can't. But you'd be amazed at how many $200, $500 checks right. come together and all of a sudden there's 9,000 people doing uh, just fabulous uh, work. Sometimes uh, people forget it's the small, even whatever you contribute, it all, it all ga gathers up. and you, you should not be set back, well, I really can't give that big amount. That's right. And, and, that's, and, that's, what we, and that's what we try to tell them. We, right. we try to tell people that, you know, if, you, if you've got a, a, a piece of your philanthropy desires to help young people, this is a niche. And, and, you know, a lot of times you sit there and say, geez, how can I solve the world's problems? But all of a sudden you can become part of a group like this. You say, wow, you know, I'm, it is pretty good. So that, that's a big piece. The second uh, piece is, is really trying to, to create a series of planning processes that will drive improvement. Athletics is, a, think of it as 18 different product lines. Right. They're all a little different. And, uh, and they've grown to, since you've been here. Yeah, we've grown, we've added two women's sports to get ourselves uh, into balance with the undergraduate uh, population. So trying to put together good planning processes uh, that will lead people to, to stretch their, their performance and, and improvement. Uh, it, you know, w w this is a job where you keep score every day. It's just the nature of our work. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, you have to be a good sport. You, you can't you can't be a poor loser uh, most of the time. Uh, but it, it, it setting up the planning process, setting up the, the the structure for the strategy, and getting people to in, engage be engaged both from the external and internal is very important. And then you know the personnel management side critical because you gotta you gotta hire good quality people and uh, um, I think that again my experiences at, at, at Inland where I was vice president of human resources and even back to my collegiate days at Purdue I think you you began to sense what are some of the characteristics and the unique thing is uh, many of the characteristics regardless of the work you're in are the same uh, they don't change they're, they're kind of the intangible behaviors that Good leaders manifest in, in many many different walks of life. Uh, so we're a little we're a little business within a business. We have about a fifty million dollar a year budget. We uh, have to build and maintain our facilities. Probably one of the biggest challenges we've had in the last sixteen years is that our facility base was was really uh, inadequate. Um, and what do I mean by inadequate? Well, you know, we we didn't have a tennis facility on campus. The kids had to go over to Industrial Park in Lafayette. Right. Uh, an aquatic center was built in 1937 that was wonderful at the time, but we couldn't do three-meter diving. Uh, we built a softball complex that has no restrooms. There are no lights at the baseball. So when I talk, I think there's a lot of people when they hear these facility projects, they, they look at a, you know, the stadium, they go, wow, you're into the glitz and the glitter. Well, that's, you got to look at it a little bit more uh, detail and you'll recognize what you're trying to do is provide contemporary facilities for competition. No different than a professor would want to have contemporary facilities right. for their laboratory. We just got so far behind that we've had to do so much in the, in the 16 years and you know my hope is that by the time we, we finish Mackey and, and do a, a renaissance there that we will have rebuilt the infrastructure and then the challenge is to make sure it never never gets that far right. out of date again. Well, when you first came then that was one of the things that you looked at a facility you realized that that was one thing that needed to be looked at. Should have recognized a little bit better maybe I'd made a different decision. <laughs> um, uh -huh. I, uh, I didn't realize how poor the facilities were and uh, um, as you got into it I recognized we, we really had a we had a challenge and we had to we had to pace that with with the the ability to build the affinity base of the John Purdue Club with the performance of the teams in the classroom and competition, and it had to kind of it had to kind of edge forward, because one had to move to support the other and vice versa. And uh, so it's been a it's been kind of an, and you had to opportune it. I mean, we 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 found projects where, where there seemed to be a strong interest at a hot time. I mean, when Drew Brees came and played quarterback, and we had some great success early in Joe Tiller's tenure. 
And that led us to the to the seventy million dollar football right. project. What people don't understand is that the pavilion, uh, about eight million of that, uh, is designed to generate revenue in terms of premium seats. That paid the debt service for the entire building. So all the concrete that needed to be repaired, the restrooms for men and women, the wider concourses, all that, you're the beneficiary, the mortgage is being paid to those premium seats. But again, the glitz causes people to focus Understand. on them. Right. Yeah. Let's talk about some of the internal, the university community and the board, your liaison with these people and the community and, and, and the president. Yeah, well, you closely. know, I, I think the director of athletics is one of those jobs in the university where we're short of the president. You're probably put in as many public positions as anybody. And, and I, I really take it as a responsibility. And it started with Dr. Berry and then with Dr. Jiski, now Dr. Cordova. I need, I need to be uh, versed well enough in what's going on in the university so that when I go out, I'm just not talking about sports. And, uh, you're talking about out, the university community. Absolutely. Right. So I'll go out. If I'm out in the, whether it be on campus or any, any event uh, where I'm asked to speak, I'll always be able to come back and talk about things that are contemporary. I think that's an important uh, uh, part of this job. But it is a visible job. And, uh, you know, again, athletics in American universities is unique. It doesn't exist in Europe. Um, it's, it, the American uh, spirit has bought into this, this competition and education model. <clears throat> I know that the, the media will talk about the extremes, um, but that's a very small tale of the, of the distribution. Both, most of these kids are just marvelous, and right, they are yeah. phenomenally driven. Um, they are compassionate, um, and uh, they, they, they have this insatiable desire to see if they can accomplish the impossible, and I think that's part of the American spirit. Right, to be exactly. With you. Do you think the, the visibility of the director has changed over time since you've been here prior than beforehand, or? Oh, I, I don't How know. I don't really have a point no. of comparison. Um, I, I, I probably, when I was at Inland, was a much more private person. Uh, my work in human resources and labor relations, I, I wasn't out in front. Sure. I do a little community talking, but not much. This was a shift for me, and, and I don't mind public speaking, but I, I hadn't had to do this much. Uh, and early on, I, it, was, it was a little nerve-wracking because I, you know, I was trying to be, today, it's, it, the more you do it, the, the easier the more is. comfortable we are. It's like a lot of things. Yeah. Do you have a liaison with the board too, the board of trustees? Yeah, do, I, uh, you you know, I'm part of Dr. Cordova's cabinet mm -hmm. uh, and I'll uh, end up uh, on an annual basis making a governance report to the board of trustees. Uh, they actually approved a resolution when I was hired uh, It still stands in the books today. I can remember it and I have it in my files, but October of 1992 the resolution was passed that Purdue is committed to developing a nationally prominent athletic program that would be excellent in all respects. And they, they, my challenge was to help them define what that would look like and then to start the path for implementation. One of the reasons we've had, I think, uh, some level of success is the stability. I, mean, I had Dr. Bering for, uh, he hired me in 93. He was with us until what, 2000. And Martin for seven years. I, I haven't had a hopscotch president, but more importantly, the board hasn't changed. Tim McGinley has been the chair of the board right. throughout. And Tim, because he was a student athlete and a very accomplished scholar, understands exactly what we're trying to do and values it. That helps. And it's huge because to, to a lot of people, if you, you know, we can come and bring a particular project, and unless you have that backdrop of what you're trying to do with these youngsters and why it's important, you say, is that really where we want to be spending our time and energy on it? And I think Tim has understood that and has been, a, I think, a great supporter. Mike Burke has been a, a tremendous yes. philanthropist for the entire university, but very helpful to me in athletics. Tom Spurgeon was a former football manager who's been, a, both Mike and, and Tom accomplished business people. And you could go on. But the board, I think they appreciate the fact that, that uh, you know, I place academics and athletics at the same tier and uh, talk about them both hand in hand. Right. And I think in turn, uh, we've been able to lay out a strategy every four or five years, kind of update it, and we're gonna be on our third version here shortly. And, uh, and it's, you know, I think, I think they bought into it. Right, exactly. Then you've got some external force. Let's talk a little bit about you know, NCAA and your alumni is another group, the NCAA. Yeah, the alumni is, is interesting because it's like having an infinite number of shareholders. And uh, the constituency groups have very different interests depending upon where they are in their life. They're very young, very old, families. 
And uh, we're, we're, we're kind of a society today with, with the explosion of multimedia that, you know, we used to have to go through traditional channels of a telephone or a letter. Now it's an email or a blog, and, and you have to be very, very careful to make sure you don't react to the squeaky wheel. I mean, we, right. we've always said that if the squeaky wheel gets oiled, you get more squeaky wheels, and you forget what you really, your primary exactly. mission. Right. So I think that's the, the challenge with the alumni activity, is really to try to, to segment the, the, the alumni and to, to make sure you're doing some things for the young alumni, some in the middle and some on the other end. And, you know, I, I'll give you a classic example. Um, the music that you play before a game in ross Aid Stadium is, is one of those little irritants for people. Uh, the older you, you are... You mean the band? No, oh. not the band. The one that's it's piping? The loudspeaker. Okay. And, and what you'll do when the kids are warming up, they'll have music on. Right. And it creates kind of the atmosphere and the kids are getting excited. Well, you know, if you're a 20-year-old student, you just think that's great. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, the older and the longer you've been out of school, you're saying, what are you putting that scratchy music on for? <laughs> and it, it, I just chuckle because, you know, I'm a product of the 60s and it was the Beatles and, and my mom and dad were going, what, what is it? What are you listening to that stuff? It hadn't changed. Just got a different different uh, year on it. And uh, so you have to, we have to find with the alumni base those different messages and points to, to engage them all. The NCAA is an interesting uh, entity. Uh, it is a governing board. We are the NCA. I think sometimes we like, we like to punch at a mythical figure. We are the NCA, but it's a, it, I sometimes, I've, I've read some of the, the great books, uh, Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin and George Washington, some of the early memoirs, and I, I can understand what they went through. Trying to gain consensus when you have this many people around a table is, is just, and, and the organization moves very slowly. And maybe it should. Maybe it needs to take time to adjust and to adapt. But uh, it, it is a, uh, for somebody who spent most of their life in private business where you have to speed is a, is a competitive advantage, it, it, it isn't the NCAA. And that was very frustrating for me very early on. I it's just, a very different organization. Yeah, I couldn't, I was having trouble coping with it. I had trouble coping with the university because the university is kind of slow. Uh, and, I, you know, I've come to it's respect. It's a different world. Yeah, I've come to respect that there, there are reasons for it. And there's probably some things in the university businesses would be wise to do, and there's some things in the university businesses or vice versa would be wise to do. So um, I, I've enjoyed it. I've served on a number of governance uh, committees uh, uh, on the national level. Um, and it's, you know, it's just interesting to watch the dynamics of people. It takes me back to my HR background. You sit in a large group of people, and you're trying to figure <laughs> out how do you get a consensus going here. And, yeah. Man, sometimes the Hatfields and McCoys are at the table. You just aren't going to get there. <laughs> how about the media? You were you're pretty very uh, very uh, interesting transition for me there. Uh, again, when I was at Inland, I, I I could, you know, I'd be press release, no further comment because you know I was doing labor negotiation. You weren't going to be out out in front of the media, and so I was very very cautious. But I had a very very capable communications person on the staff, and uh, he taught me a lot. Um, but when I got here, Joe Bennett really taught me and. Uh, you know, I, I think early on he, he said, you know, Morgan, you're never going to win the battle to have more ink than you have. If you come across as heavy-handed or, or irritated, it's just going to make matters worse. And he said, you have to learn how to answer the same question six different ways, but with a degree of empathy. And he said, you'll, you'll remember that beat reporter has got a job to do. And all he or she is trying to do is get a story written. Right. And they'll write the story for you if you'll if you'll help them with the facts. And uh, I struggled early on. I mean, I'll never forget when they were going to announce my appointment, which, you know, Purdue wanted to kind of keep it a secret until I got down there. Well, Tom Kubot of the Journal Courier was up in my house or my yard in Munster, Indiana, hiding in the bushes. I thought, this is odd. And, uh, you know, and I've gotten to be good friends with Tom over the years. And so, you know, I think, I, I think I've recognized now when you're talking to the media, it's a unique opportunity to take your message uh, and, and put it out there. And right. uh, if you help them, uh, th they'll try to be fair, even if it's a tough story. You know, we're going to have a youngster misbehave, do something wrong in the community. You're better off to get them the facts and make sure that they, you put it in a context for them. So they can just, pick it up correctly. Exactly. All right. 
And then, of course, the Big Ten is another, you know, that, that's changed over time, too, since you've been here. Yeah, it has. Uh, we've been very Certainly fortunate. Certainly the network is a source. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we've been very fortunate there. We've had, again, uh, I think one of the best collegiate commissioners in the, in the country, Jim Delaney. Um, we, again, the, 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 the governance system in the Big Ten, uh, the shared governance between the faculty athletic rep and the athletic right. director is... You uh, work with them, too, as yes, well. Yes, and, and we've been blessed at Purdue. Uh, uh, Phil Nelson and Martha Chiskin were, were here when I came in and are dear friends today, but great colleagues, and now Jeff Bolin and Chris Saley. The beauty of what Purdue's done, and I, I give credit to Dr. Berry and Dr. Cordova, is they selected um, very, very uh, impressive scientists, people who are members of the academy who are, are respected. I, I think there is a pecking order in the academy. Yeah, sure. And I think at Purdue, our faculty reps are listened to. And in true Purdue fashion, they don't monopolize. They're not. They're not uh, always, you know, banging the bell. But when they listen, people speak, and that's been that's been very helpful. The Big Ten's uh, governance system, which goes back to, to our own President James Smart in 1896, right. um, I think has always tried to be ahead of the game in terms of trying to make sure academics didn't get lost. Some of the early academic standards in the Big Ten have become precursors of what have occurred at the NCAA. Um, and the revenue sharing formulas in the Big Ten are very generous. Uh, we really do want to make sure the conference is healthy. Go into some other conferences, you'll find that uh, uh, there's a performance orientation so the rich get richer and the poor can't get out of the basement. That's not healthy at the end. I think in, in this decade uh, we've had six, seven uh, schools win the football title, for example. That's healthy. Everybody should have a chance to take right, their exactly. lungs to the Rose Bowl. I think you'll hear people will agree with you. Yeah, that. yeah. Right. I don't think you, you need so, but everybody wants to be competitive. You don't want to be beat forty-nine to nothing, but you want to, you want to be competitive. So the Big Ten resources, and we bundle a lot of our rights, media rights and the like, together as a conference because collectively they're worth more than we could individually sell them sure. for. In rough numbers, fifty percent of our revenue comes from tickets. Twenty-five percent comes from things that are bundled up with the Big Ten. NCAA uh, basketball and, and Big Ten rights. And the third piece is what we will do lar locally in marketing and then the John Purdue Club. Yeah. That's that what I was going to ask you next on the budget. And of course, the thing is, well, something I read said we never budget for a great year, and but you have to be accountable. So it's, it's a challenge. Well, you, you, you always have to be, if you inflate your, your paid attendance estimates, it can be dangerous because you'll, you'll end up spending money thinking the money's coming in and it's not. So. I, again, I've been fortunate. Uh, I've had the same business managers I've been here, and Glenn is, Tompkins is uh, probably understands this world as, as well as anybody. And that's a help, <laughs> huh? That's it is a, a huge help. help. And and, right. uh, and, I, and again, I think my business experience has is, is helped. Uh, um, once you get going on, it's not that complicated. But there there's a few levers you need to watch and be careful of. And you know, we always try to make sure that we we know there will be a rainy day, so we always want to kind of. Make sure there's a little rainy day fund to weather you through uh, any kind of turbulent times you have. And, uh, and so we've been careful. We, we've turned a, a budgetary surplus each year I've been here. And then our, we have a process that allows us to prioritize uh, special budget requests after the end of the year. And that's how we've taken some of these smaller projects. And if, you know, if we have a little surplus, we'll allocate it and try to prioritize it based upon sure. our strategic plan. So, um, we've tried to reinvest. We're not, we're not just trying to build up reserves, but we want to make sure that we always take care of the operating expenses first. For something left over, kind of right. like your family budget, yeah. then you How about ticket, uh, the ticket prices? That's one thing that you have to look at, and, and, that, yeah, and it's, that's and difficult. It's, yeah, uh, it is. Uh, you have to keep abreast of the marketplace, and uh, you know, I, I, I think it's hard because when, when the uh, people look at it, and they go, man, am I going to spend forty dollars to go to a football game? And I go, well, um, you spend seventy-five dollars to go to a concert for two hours. Uh, if you go to a movie, which is an hour, hour and a half, you're going to spend ten. So I said, on a per-hour basis, I'm not so sure it's much different. And you, know, you just, it, it, you have to, you have to educate. To look at it. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Yeah. Um, and you, you had given the revenue percentages, and of course, TV contracts have really increased over. Uh, over time, because it came. Yeah, and I, and I think uh, the the Big Ten Network, which we launched uh, uh, this year, is uh, I think uh, going to be one of those uh, watershed events. Um, 
what was happening is, uh, particularly with ESPN, as cable TV exploded, uh, they needed content. I mean, they're on the air, on the air 24/7. And, and they were, they were uh, basically, it, it was becoming more and more challenging to control your own destiny. And so the, the, <clears throat> the distribution company was telling the content providers, kind of here's the lay of the land, and we're going we're to pay some money <clears throat> to run your, your programming through these tubes to bring it out to the, to the household. And, and uh, <clears throat> so we got into the negotiations in 2003, it was very clear that, uh, that the, the, what we need is to sustain the broad-based programs, the, the men and women who are involved. There's only two sports <clears throat> that make any net revenue. It's football and men's basketball. All the others are, are net beneficiaries of those two sports, and that's okay. But if you're going to maintain that broad-based program and you're going to you know, face scholarship costs that are going up 7, 8, 9, 10 percent, you've got to have some revenue streams that, that grow We're faster do that. than that. Right. So the, 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 when, the, when the discussions with ESPN got a little bit uh, rocky, you know, we began to think maybe, maybe it's time. And we knew where, we knew where high-definition television was going and, and digital TV. <clears throat> and we were really encouraged by some of the people who consulted with us that the Big Ten was a unique footprint. And the alumni bases were large not only within the footprint of the Big Ten, but around the country. It really seemed to have the demographics that would make it. And that's what led us to work with Fox and, and do this venture. And uh, it will provide exposure for sports that some people haven't seen. And I don't know that people would necessarily turn on their TV to look at a, at a women's softball game or a, a men's track uh, event. But if it's a Purdue person, they'll turn on Purdue. Exactly. <clears throat> and so it, it, people have really enjoyed the first year. Uh, it was the fastest growing new station ever in United States history. 30 million homes in 30 days. Now we still have some issues and some challenges that need to be uh, cleared, but I think ultimately people will realize that while athletics is the base content, this will allow the universities to tell their story in a very, very special way. Um, we have complicated things happening at this university and all the research universities. For somebody to understand the significance of a break breakthrough on a protein they don't it's not easy for the common person to understand right. turns out that Fox who is our partner in this uh, is the engine behind the National Geographic Channel and the National Geographic Channel is cleared in 55 million homes of the 80 million cable homes and satellite homes in the United States today and if you watch National Geographic I've always marveled how they'll take very complex subjects and break it down I go oh that's what it means so think about how the network, if you take nanotechnology, every university in the Big Ten is doing something in that area. You could see an 11-week series where you know, Northwestern tells its chapter, Wisconsin, Purdue. I think there's amazing implications for these research institutions to, to, really, take, to really get their message across in a way that, that, that you know, Joe and Molly on the street will say, oh, that's what they're doing at Purdue. And you can't do that. <clears throat> and the, the, the value of that um, 60 hours of programming it. will be a lot more important to people 10 years than it is right. today. Most yeah. people view it as a sports channel. I don't. I think it's much broader. Right. It has broader things. We, we've talked a little bit about it. Let's just address a couple of comments on fundraising. And you had said earlier this is one of those things that you're involved in. Of course, the John Purdue Club has been around for a long time, and the membership keeps increasing. Just You're a couple 50, comments. 50 years in the John Purdue Club this year in 2008. It was founded in 1958. Wow. Uh, when I came, it had 2,000 members roughly. It's now nine on our way to 12. Uh, they've been a very generous group. And uh, we know that if a person becomes a member of the John Purdue Club and they stay with us for three years, they're with us for life. And the beauty of the club has always been that I'll have an annual reminder letter that will go out to people when their membership is up. And I'll just tell them what the scholarship percent that I'm faced, and it's amazing how many people index their gifts. They see it's going up six percent, and they're giving two hundred dollars. They'll write a check for two twelve, and that's that's the beauty of it. People have just been very, very uh, generous. Um, they've been very helpful on the on the on the, the capital campaigns because I think we built the case, and they understood why we were doing it. And uh, you know now I think people are getting kind of excited because as we're 
on the verge of, of taking this landmark called Mackey Arena that's now 40 years of age and bringing it into the 21st century. Uh, I haven't had anybody as I've gone out and talked about the project say, well, that's a dumb idea or why are we doing that? Um, it, it's challenging, but I think, I think when it's done and we have that new first game, the rededication game, November 11th, 2011, It'll be a special moment. <laughs> How do you select people for? Do you have advisory committees for some of the uh, for your facility expansions that you do? Uh, I have an advisory committee fundraising. of former student athletes that that is like a dean's advisory committee, uh -huh. and they'll meet with us uh, once a year. And I generally try to uh, uh, every sports represented. Generally, I can get somebody who's been been out of school ten plus years, <clears throat> maybe has had a significant experience. Beth Buck is a great example right now. Beth is a global vice chair of Ernst & Young. And she has uh, uh, played basketball at Purdue in the, in the late 70s, early 80s. You get somebody like Beth connected, it, boy, she's just helpful. She'll come talk to the kids. She'll, I mean, she's amazing. So you want to bring somebody of, of substance, not, not necessarily money. I'm not saying that's the driver. But somebody who can bring some life experience. Brings a nice mix to it. Right. Yeah, and yeah. they do two things. One, they get kind of excited to come back for a day. It's not a huge time commitment. Two, it's a resource during the course of the year if you have some issues you're wrestling with. <clears throat> Three, when they come in, it's a good sounding board. If you're going to try out a particular message or plan, they, they'll be in a position to say, well, wait a minute. Maybe you want to think about casting a little differently. And and uh, I think the, the, the coaches that are most... Uh, uh, aggressive will get them involved in making sure either from a, helping them with how to write a resume to doing mock interviews uh, uh, and they just love it I mean they, they'll just do that and we always tie it into homecoming so there's a reason to come back and uh, they've been very helpful to us yeah that sounds very good a um, couple uh, one thing on uh, diversity and, t and title that Title IX, that's really increased over time. It changes, haven't yeah, it? Yeah, and it was well over, long overdue. Right. Uh, <clears throat> it's interesting if you go back and look at the, the uh, congressional record on that. Uh, um, the whole Title IX thing was kind of a throw in. Uh, it was kind of somebody said, well, if you're going to do that, then I, I guess we should do this. And that's really how it came into being. And, right. and, uh, Having read that, I understand. <clears throat> that. People, people fought it for a better part of a decade, in some cases, too. And, uh, I, I, you know, again, I think if you go back and look at my swimming background, I knew what it was like to be a have-not. I knew what it was like to be kind of looked down by the football players that you're really not an athlete. I'm swimming more, I'm better shape than you are. So I, I had, I had a bit of empathy. I swam next to the, to the, to the young women who were told that when you're 16, you peak in swimming because that's just, that's just part of your physiological makeup. Well, that's that was, that's nonsense. <clears throat> and so I, I, you know, I, I've never had any problem supporting. In fact, when I first got here, I, first thing I did is I said, we're not referring to the non-revenue sports that way anymore. We're going to refer to them as Olympic sports. And I said, I just, that's just, a, we're going to get that term right. all Good out point. of our vernacular. <clears throat> and I, you know, I think one of the things that I really appreciate, I think it's, it's a, a, a testimony that change is happening. Is in 1990. Five, my daughter was a high school senior at West Lafayette High School, and she sat there, and the Journal Courier had done a big expose on, on gender equity. And she read all of it, and she came back to me and said, Dad, what is this all about? I don't really understand. She says, from the time I've grown up, from the time we were in Munster that we came down here, I've never felt like my differences are any different than, than the guys. And I said, well, Joyce, that's, that's good. That means we've, we've, society's made some change. But I said, your mother can't say that. <clears throat> I said, your mother really never had the opportunity. And uh, I said, you know, my biggest hope will be that in, in 20 years, you won't talk about gender equity at all. It, it has just become built into the fabric. And I think if you watch the youth programs today. It's well, moving in that direction. Yeah, and, and I, I think true. the thing I always remind my leadership is, you know, let's not take kind of our disappointments of the past and, and use those as seed to keep it fomented into the future. If, if we get something fixed and we, we're doing the right things, let it go. We can't undo what happened to each of us, but we, we don't have to <coughs> perpetuate that into the, into right. the next generation. I agree. A couple of <coughs> things on recognition. I think I would just make a comment. The Athletics and the Purdue, the Purdue Football Hall of Glory, that's, that's very nice. There was a nice article about that. And I don't think people recognize it. And the other is your Athletic Hall of Fame. Right. 
That was a new thing that yeah, started. Yeah, we, we actually it was one of the first uh, uh, things our advisory council did. So we've probably got 13 or 14 classes now, lift them up on the web, do a nice banquet. Do it every 18 months, not every 12. And the reason is that uh, we want to make it a special group. I think you can do these things and right. overpopulate them. I, I think the people that come in really ought to be people who <coughs> whose uh, performance merited that. And 18 months allows to do it one year in the spring and then 18 months later in the fall. So if you have somebody who's still playing uh, professional sports, you can find a way to get them uh, incorporated. But it, it is uh, important to remember your past. Uh, we try to use the vignettes uh, that are produced to, right. to, to allow the, the, the new youngsters to see it uh, when they come on campus in the fall. And then we've really tried in our facilities to do some things where we, rather than building a standalone museum, which to me is just money that I don't think we have, I like to use the public space in these buildings to tell the story. And if you go into the Mollenkopf, the Purdue Football <coughs> Hall of Glory is just that. It, 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 in about 10 minutes, you get a sense of kind of history. And as we do Mackey, we will take the concourse, which will become double wide now, because we're going to take all the offices out of the perimeter of the concourse. So we'll get a lot more mingling space. We'll tell the history of the basketball program, the men and the women at Purdue. Very and so nice. you, you, you'll, you'll do it in a way that, that is uh, kind of fun, uh, kind of reminds you we want the Mackey project to be a retro project where the 21st century amenities are brought to the perimeter. And as you walk back in, you walk back in time. And you'll remember that first game in 1967. Super. like that idea. <laughs> uh, do you participate much in the alumni? I know you work with alumni, but being a Purdue grad, you... Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, Kate and I are lifelong sure. uh, members okay. of the Alumni Association, John Purdue Club members. Kate, Kate gives to pharmacy. I give to Craner. I've always believed people uh, generally will find multiple pots if they think there's a legitimate reason. Um, you know, probably most of my time has been out in front of alumni as part of this job as opposed to, sure. there'll be a time when I'm a, group. I left the stands to come do this. I will, at some point in time, go back to the stands. <laughs> uh, how about a favorite Purdue tradition and an outstanding event in your life? I think uh, probably the, 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 the biggest Purdue tradition, it may be a silly one for some people, but when, I, when that W flag is flying over the stadium, that means that we had won our last home game, our last game. You're just something about seeing that flag flying that as I come to work in the morning and when you lose the last game of the year you go a whole year without seeing it up and that drives me crazy. <laughs> uh, you know I, I, I think again that, that teaching people how to compete at the highest possible level is important that kind of symbolizes it for me. Yeah and how about your legacy some things that, and uh, some final comments. That well, I think my share. I don't know I mean history will write your own legacy. I, I, I've been blessed to uh, have this opportunity, you know, I, my uh, my wife and I felt like this would be a good community to raise the kids in. Turned out it was. All had a great education and now are, are, are making a difference in their life. You know, at the end of the day, uh, when you when you meet your maker, that's probably what's the most important. And uh, uh, the, we don't have any arguments about Purdue because the whole family's Purdue. It turns <laughs> out my brothers and sisters are Purdue grads. Most of my, my uh, their spouses are Purdue grads. So it's it's just fun. Uh, it it I'm probably a little bit more intense because I know what we're what we're trying to accomplish is something we haven't done before. And uh, but at but at the end of the day, uh, if you turn out a hundred good leaders a year over your tenure, and those kids multiply their impact, that's that's probably what uh, at the end of the day you've accomplished. Very good. Very good. This okay. concludes the interview. Thank you very good. much. You're more very, than welcome. very much.